recording now. So welcome back everyone. So if you want to design a primer for the human myoglobin gene and you for example want to amplify the coding sequence between 153 and 464 base pairs then of course the first thing that you need to do is get the sequence. Oh. Yeah, there. So what you do then is you copy paste the sequence into primer 3 and then you say I want to pick a left primer, I want to pick a right primer and then and you want to specify which you want to target. And so you want to target a certain region of the gene. And then and after you specified which target you wanted to have, you say pick primers. What it will show you is the output. So the output that it will show you, it will show you the region where it picked the primer. So this is the first primer, the forward primer. It will show you the target sequence highlighted with stars. And it will show you the reverse primer. And that will be the other way. All right, summary, far better done by machines. Many programs are available and the example that I showed you of primer three. I will actually do a live primer three. Um, so here, let's go back to the cow sequence that we had. Um, so this is the cow sequence that we had. The snip here is in the middle, right? So it's at um, uh, 500 base pairs after and 500 base pairs before. So we just copy paste the sequence so let's copy the sequence, we go to primer 3 and we just paste the sequence in. So there's two ways of specifying where you want to have your target. You can use the target field, however you can also just highlight the sequence using the square brackets. So hey, because, um, can I make the box a little bit bigger? Yeah, I can. Right, so here we see our sequence. Um, and so in this case, we know where the target is exactly. So it's better to use the target here. And so the target is specified as 50, 2, which means that you require the primer to surround the two bases as position 50 and 51. So in this case, our target is at 500. And the target is, no, I will say the target is at 499 and we want to span three base pairs. So we want to have the primer located at, or we want to have the primer spanning 499, 500 and 501. So just that the primer is not like stuck directly to the, uh, to the snip. Um, I want to have a left primer and a right primer, and I'm just going to say pick my primers. And in this case here, we see the target sequence. So the snip is in the middle. So that's the G here and we have the forward primer being chosen and the reverse primer. It will tell us then that the left primer starts here, the length, you see that the TM is relatively close to each other, so it's, it's slightly less than two degrees Celsius, which is perfectly fine. Um, there's no chance of a hairpin, um, there's no chance of um, dimerization with itself, and uh, the, the three prime is also perfectly fine. If these numbers are not zero, these, these three numbers here, um, then there is a chance that there will be a primer. Uh, that there will be a dimer or that it will fold back on itself. Um, but in this case, these primers look perfectly fine. So this is the sequence that we need to order for the forward primer. And this is the sequence that we need to order for the reverse primer. And then hey, we would amplify this piece and it will tell us that we would get a, um, a product of 231 base pairs. So hey, we, when, we, when we would do the reaction, we would put it on a gel and then it should be at around 231. We should see a little band, and this band is the band that we want. All right, so that, that's it for primer design. Like it's not, it's not magic, it's just that you have to be very careful. And of course, make sure that you always mask your sequence using either using Ensemble or using the, uh, the, the uh, repeat masker tool to just get rid of the repeats. Because there, hey, if you would not have repeat masked it, then it might have chosen a primer in the wrong region. All right, so that's it for the primer designs. Um, are there any questions? Because if there are no questions, then I would like to spend the remaining 45 minutes talking about my PhD thesis about the CTL mapping in relationship to the QTL mapping part. So I'm just going to wait for a little bit to see if anyone has a question on how to design primers. Um, if 
you want to learn more about Gesmers or if you want to learn more about semi-universal primers, then just, just ask. If not, then let's go to the other PowerPoint then. Good. So this is more or less where we stopped last week. So last week we, we I talked a lot about quantitative trait locus mapping, right? So about the standard QTL mapping. So a QTL, a quantitative trait locus, is a section of the DNA, which is called a locus, which is associated with a variation in a phenotype. So a phenotype here is always a quantitative trait, not a qualitative trait, um, because otherwise we would be using another quantitative trait mapping. So I showed you this one, right? So this, this slide before. And so to detect the QTL in a population, we have to measure the genotypes. So in this case, we have A, B genotypes. And for example, we can use SNPs or AFLPs or RFLPs. And we have to have our phenotype of interest measured. For example, the tail length of an animal or the yield or the, the amount of uh, protein in the milk. Um, yeah, so here, for example, we have a whole bunch of mice, so 1 to 9, and then yeah, this will continue up until like 3, 400, if you have 3, 400 mice measured. Yeah, all of these have a, have a phenotype, and all of these mice come with their genome being part or either coming either from the mother or coming from the father. And so at a certain genetic marker have we compute the difference and we want to see if the mean of the A group is different from the mean of the B group and then after we see that there is a difference we also want to know how likely that difference is. And so again the nice little animation that just goes through all of the different markers on the genome and that for every marker you will get an effect size um, and it will tell you if the mean of the A group is smaller than the B or is smaller than the B group or if it's larger than the B group. So and just basic QTL mapping, just go through the genome, and marker by marker, scan it and, and write down the difference. We use statistics to, assa uh, to assess the association of the markers and we can use things like t-tests or ANOVA or regression and this really depends on how your genotypes are structured and if your phenotype is a normally distributed phenotype or if it's different. So and there's, and the, the model that you have to use is dependent on uh, the phenotype distribution and the amount of groups that you have in your genotypes. And we always express it as a minus log 10 of the p-value. Right, so you, you plot it across the genome. We already saw this one before. And here in R, we can, for example, use RQTL, one of these packages which is made for QTL mapping in R, uh, to do the QTL mapping. And so if you want to produce this picture, and we can go to, uh, we can load the library. So we say library QTL. We load this data set, which is the hypertension data set in mice. So we just say data hyper, and then we just plot and the function that scans for QTL is called scan1. So just scan1, the hyper data set, and then we just plot that and then you get this picture. So QTL mapping comes with some severe limitations. One of the main things is, is that it only considers a single phenotype at, at a time. Right, because we're just looking at a single phenotype and at each marker we split into two groups or into three groups and then we look to see if there's a difference in the mean of this phenotype. And so we only consider a single phenotype. One of the other limitations is that the phenotype needs to show significant differences. Because if a phenotype is only varying by a little bit, right? if you look at, for example, the amount of... Um, the amount of arms of a certain of, of a human right so almost every human has like two arms and there's no big variation there um, at least not genetically and well it sometimes happens that people get born with like three arms or no arms but it like it is very hard to find the genetic location which is involved in things which do not vary right that's one of the limitations of qtl mapping so hey it's it's if there's no variation, you cannot associate it with a location in the genome. And one of the other problems is, is that the, if, if two phenotypes are like very correlated to each other, then their QTL profiles look exactly the same. Um, because mapping the one phenotype is similar to mapping the other one, because they are 
more or less correlated to each other. And so this is one of these reasons why QTL mapping is sometimes not the best method to use. So when I was doing my PhD, I thought about how can you kind of circumvent this, these limitations, right? These limitations are very detrimental to the method in a way, because hey, you, you want to not just consider a single phenotype, you want to look at multiple phenotypes or the relationship between them. Um, hey, if a phenotype doesn't really show a lot of significant differences, um, it might still be that there is enough difference that combined with another phenotype, you could find a regulator or a locus which is controlling your phenotype. So imagine two linked phenotypes in a, in, a, in a plant population. And in plants, it's, it's very common um, that you have, for example, that your susceptibility to infection and the amount of produce that you make, so your yield and your susceptibility to infection is generally highly correlated with each other, right? Because if I improve the yield of the plant, automatically this plant starts becoming more susceptible to infection. Um, has so bigger yield is higher susceptibility. And in plants, we call this the yield plateau. So if you very, if you look at, for example, the selection in, in, in wheat fields from like 1892 to 2000, and then you see um, had that, that the first part, there was no real improvement. And had then we had pedigree selection. So hey, you see that the average goes up a little bit. And then at a certain point, like in 1950, we started doing scientific breeding and we started to use like, um, um, we started to use things like more or less association and QTL mapping, right? And then you see that the yield of, 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 of uh, wheat actually goes up quite tremendously. But you see that around since the 1990s, we don't see a, ma a massive increase anymore because phenotypes are linked to the yield phenotype. When we are selecting for higher yield, we are making plants which are more susceptible to infection or which are not as... Um, which cannot um, protect themselves against like wind and these kinds of things anymore. Yeah, because the, the weed becomes so big that when there's a little gust of wind, the thing falls over and the plant dies. Yeah, so um, yeah, when we started doing like the scientific breeding approach using either pedigrees or using QTL mapping information, we see a massive increase, but this increase is leveling off, especially in the last like 10 years, we haven't been able to improve plants um, as much as we could in like the 20 years or 30 years before that. Um, so this is called the yield plateau. So the method that I developed is called correlated trait locus mapping based on, on QTL. So I define a correlated trait locus or in my thesis, I define a correlated trait locus as a, a locus is a section of DNA, which is associated not with a difference within a single phenotype with between the means, but which is associated with the difference in correlation between two phenotypes. So how do we then do that, right? Because normally we would just go at a certain marker, we look at our phenotype and we split it into two groups, and then we look the mean in the one group and the mean in the other group. So CTL mapping is very, very similar to QTL mapping, but it is multi-phenotype because we're now not using a single phenotype, we're using a pair of phenotypes. So what do we do? We identify genetic regions where there is a difference in the phenotype-phenotype correlation structure, and that is conditional on the genotype of the marker. In one of the advantages of CTL mapping, similar to QTL mapping, is that it's unbiased and it's data-driven, so you, 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 you don't have to have any prior information. Of course, you have to have measured two or more phenotypes. But normally when you do an experiment, you're not measuring a single phenotype, you're already measuring multiple phenotypes, right? If I'm, if I'm doing, if I'm a plant researcher, um, I'm measuring like the yield of the plant, the number of leaves, the height, and all of these things, the susceptibility. Hey, if I'm a fish researcher, I'm also measuring more things than just uh, the single phenotype that I'm interested in. So applications of CTL mapping are that you can, it's, Classical selection in breeding to improve economically interested phenotype because we can get rid of this yield plateau if we could break the correlation between the susceptibility and the improvement in yield, right? Um, so we could select for beneficial CTL locus similar to how we could select for similar QTL loci, right? So for 
plants and yields, yeah, we would want to select for markers where the correlation between yield and susceptibility is low. Yeah, and this will allow us to break this linkage between the different phenotypes. Yeah, and of course we need to combine this with QTL data and if we combine it with QTL data, CTL mapping also allows us to build phenotype-phenotype connection networks. So yeah, which phenotype is is connected to other phenotypes. So hey, in this yield plateau, hey, if we have both phenotypes, yield and susceptibility will show very similar QTL profiles because of their overall correlation. Hey, because yield is, is, is highly correlated with susceptibility, when we scan for yield, we get a QTL profile. When we scan for susceptibility, we get a QTL profile which looks very similar. Yeah, but CTL mapping tries to find loci in the genome where this correlation between yield and susceptibility is lost. Yeah, so we can use this CTL information to break the link or the correlation between yield and susceptibility, allowing us to have like one generation of selecting for individuals which do not show correlation between yield and susceptibility if we do that for one generation, then in the next generation we can select for high yields again, but now increasing the yield will not lead to an increase in susceptibility because in the previous generation we already broken that link, we already broken that, that combination. So a question to you guys, hey, imagine that for example phenotype A here is the yield of the plant, phenotype B is the susceptibility and now we're looking at a single marker in the genome and we see this picture. So we see that in the AA genotype they are strongly correlated and in the BB genotype hey, there is really no correlation. Hey, in the high yield individuals have, um, hey, so individuals which have a high yield have a susceptibility which is more or less medium or they have a susceptibility which is high. So my question to you, if, if I am a plant breeder and I see this picture of a certain marker, right, which, which genotype should I put into the ground for the next generation? Should I put individuals in the ground who have a strong correlation, which have the AA genotype, or should I put individuals in there which have the BB genotype, which have low correlation? And I'm just going to wait for an answer. We can actually do a... Um, I, I figured out that we can actually do a... Um, um, how does Twitch call that? Um, Twitch has a prediction function. So we can actually start a prediction and then you guys can kind of bet on it using your channel points. And then the winner gets the channel points from the people that got it wrong. We should do that more often to kind of... But my question to you guys is, if I'm a plant breeder and I see this picture, which plants should I breed? Should I breed the AA genotype plants or should I be breed the BB genotype plants? No answer in chat, so I'm just going to assume that everyone's sleeping. Um, so, of course, in this case, you want to breed the BB genotype individuals because the BB genotype individuals do not show the relationship. Um, hey, they do not have the correlation. Hey, because if we would breed the AA genotype, we would not lose the correlation between yield and susceptibility. All right, so you can use... I thought we were betting on it. Ah, oh, damn it! Then say that. Like, come on, people. <laughs> you were waiting for me to start the prediction. We will do that next time. Uh, next time that we have a question, I will I will make sure that we start a prediction on it. Uh, but but you can use the correlated trait locus mapping technique to select genotypes which unlink the two phenotypes that you don't want to have linked to each other. And so the next generation now shows a decreased correlation between the phenotypes which allows you to select for high yield again without increasing susceptibility. Yeah, so yeah, and it's the same as uh, so and yeah, afterwards so after one generation of breaking you can then select individuals again based on standard QTL information because now all of a sudden the QTL profile for yield will look different for uh, susceptibility. Alright, so the methodology, I think that it's uh, 
it, it's interesting to just see how we do that. Um, so to explain the method, I use recombinant inbred lines, right? Because then we only have two genotype groups and we don't have to deal with like four or five or heterozygous and these kinds of things. Yeah, but the, the CTL package that I wrote, which is available in R, um, can handle any type of cross. So it doesn't matter if your species has two chromosomes or if it has four chromosomes. Um, it doesn't matter how you cross them, if you have like... Um, homozygous AA, heterozygous, homozygous BB, or if you have four load side and you can have everything like four A's, uh, three A's and a B, uh, two A's, two B's. Yeah, so the, the package deals with that. But then um, recombinant inbred line. So in this example, I will assume that we have four different phenotypes that we measured and we will be just looking at six genetic markers. And at these markers, there's only two possible alleles, the AA allele or the BB allele. So how does it work? We select a phenotype, so P1, for example, and then we select a genetic marker in the genome. So here in this picture, we're only looking at um, a single phenotype and at a single marker. So what do we do? We split the individuals in two groups by genotype. So we have AA individuals and we have BB individuals. So, and what do we now do is we calculate the correlation of both the AA and the BB genotypes of P1 times all the other phenotypes. And then we get a correlation factor, right? So here we do the correlation of phenotype one versus, phenot versus the other one, so PX in AA. So we just take only the individuals which are AA at marker one and then we calculate the correlation. Of course, the correlation of P1 to itself is always one. That's just the way that correlation works. Yeah, because that, that. But for example, the correlation of, of uh, P1 to P2 in the AA group is 0 0.1. The correlation of P1 versus P2 in the BB group is 0 0.2. Right? And we can we just do that for all the phenotypes that we have. So here we get two vectors. One vector is the correlation of P1 versus the other phenotypes in the AA group. And we have P1 versus all the other phenotypes in the BB group. So what we observe now here is that when we when we calculate QTL effect size, we take the difference in mean between A and B. If we talk about CTL effect size, we take the difference in correlation between the AA group and the BB group. And so we make a difference vector, which we just say, well, we, we just subtract this one from this one. So have one minus one is zero, 0 0.1 minus 0 0.2 is a 0 0.1. Um, so it's the difference. It's the absolute difference between the correlation in the groups. And what we see now is that there's something interesting because we see that at this marker, there is a big difference between the correlation of P1 versus P4 because in the AA group it's 0 0.8, in the BB group it's only 0 0.1. So we see that there's a 0 0.7 difference in correlation. So now what we do, and this is the big trick, we now do this not for one marker, but we do this for all markers in the genome, right? So here we see the result from the last slide, right? So, and now we just, we just took, we took this factor that we calculated and we just flop it on its side. So we just make this the first, um, we make this the first um, marker, right? And then we do it for marker two, marker three, marker four, marker five, and marker six, right? So we have six markers, four phenotypes. And then what we see happening is when we repeat this calculation for our, um, for every genetic marker, we get multiple vectors and every vector, hey, if you have multiple vectors, we can combine them in a single matrix. Hey, and then what you will see is that there's also linkage. So hey, marker one and marker two are very close to each other. Hey, so the correlation difference for P1 versus P4 at this marker is 0 0.7, at marker two it's 0 0.6, and then you see it go down um, quite slowly. Hey, and for P1 with P3, we see this as well. The thing is, is that you don't get just one matrix, right? We're doing this for P1 versus all the other ones, but we're also doing it for P2 versus the other ones and for P3 versus the other ones. So we get not one matrix, but we get four of these matrices. Yeah. And of course, if you map P1 against P1, the difference is always zero, right? Because the correlation is one in the AA group, one in the BB group. So the difference between one and one will always be zero. So based on the matrix, right, you can see which phenotype you mapped. 
if you take p2 and map against the other phenotypes then the, then this one would be zero if you take p3 map it against the other then these would be zeros uh, then these would be zero all right so now we have to do permutation right because we if you have a difference in mean if you, if you have two groups right and you have a difference between the mean then you can just do a basic t-test but we cannot do a t-test here we 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 cannot t-test based on correlation values right because we don't have a group of individuals anymore so at this point we now have to start repeating our analysis so we have to use permutation to find our significance right because here we see our effect size matrix this is the effects the ctl effect size of p1 versus the other phenotypes at each of the marker but we don't know if this 0 0.7 is really a significant difference right so we need to just do permutation so we break the link between the genotypes and the phenotypes right so we assign genotypes to individuals at random and we redo the whole analysis and we remember the maximum observed score so the maximum observed difference in the correlation and then we make a distribution out of these 10,000 scores and we find the 5% and 1% threshold values for significant just like in QTL mapping but now of course the method is much more involved because we have to do correlation calculations a lot and which are not they are more expensive than calculating the mean and so we use 10,000 10, permutations to assign the significance you could also use a direct calculation of p-values using mathematics so if we if we if you use the CTL package that I published for R, then it has a direct calculation of p-values as well as a permutation approach. Um, and we do the same thing again, so we convert the differences to p-values, and then we convert these p-values to lot scores by using the minus log 10 p-value, just like in QTL mapping. So what do we do? We convert these to uh, to uh, minus log 10 p-values so when we perform a QTL mapping for p1 and we get um, I think this should say when performing a CTL mapping for p1 uh, we get four vectors of lot scores from CTL mapping and we get one vector of lot scores from QTL mapping right so ha here we see the different vectors so for for p1 against p1 the lot score is always zero right because the difference is zero the lot score is also zero um, yeah, but we now see for example that we get scores of 7.1 6.2 6.2 and 5.1 yeah, in the likelihood that there is a significant difference in correlation yeah, and compared to the information that you get from QTL mapping right because we also QTL mapped p1 across the genome hey you get like a QTL profile um, and so we have a QTL profile where for each marker we have a single score but for CTL mapping for each marker you get an n amount of scores where n is the number of phenotypes that you scan so how do you then visualize it so this picture is a little bit annoying because that it doesn't really show below hey, but you get a QTL score of p1 so I always plot those at the top so this is the the the, um, the same phenotype as that we did during the assignments last time so you see here that there are two peaks one on chromosome 4 one on chromosome 5 but what you see in here in the bottom is that you see three different lines or four different lines like one of the lines is just zero 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 right so in, in color you see the four different lines and so you see that there is a little bit of correlation lost with the red phenotype which is the third one and you see here in blue you see that there's a big correlation loss uh, with the one um, on on chromosome 5 and and the scale here is a little bit off but they are significant peaks if you want to call it like that all right so that was the thing that I wanted to tell, tell you about CTL mapping so CTL mapping is very similar to QTL mapping and but instead of taking taking uh, one phenotype and doing the mapping and what we do is we take uh, two phenotypes or a pair of phenotypes or multiple phenotypes and we just say well we want to know one phenotype versus the other one and so in CTL mapping your output is not just a single QTL profile it is a single QTL profile plus a correlation profile for your phenotype that you selected versus all the other phenotypes in your data set and then you can do nifty stuff with that because the information here allows you hey, because in some cases hey, if your phenotype of interest does not show any um, any variance right so if it's if it's then you will not find a QTL so the QTL profile would just be flat 
but the CTL profile might show you that there are regions in the genome where the correlation is lost between your phenotype of interest and some other um, uh, and some other phenotype. And so you might find regions of the genome um, which are not um, which are not visible using the standard peaks or using standard QTL mapping. I hope that it's clear. If you have any questions, then just ask me. I can I can show you in R as well if you if you're interested in that. Um, yeah, because the the CTL package is just available. Let me show you in R. Why not? We're here now, and we still have 20 minutes, right? So this was the QTL mapping that we did, right? So um, let me go and open up the R window for myself. All right, so we just do library uh, QTL to load the QTL data set, and then we can do library CTL, and CTL is the package that I made, right? So now we are going to use data, and we're going to use multi-trade which is the data set that I use for testing. So multi-trait is the data set phenotype genotypes that you guys um, had, right? So it has 24 phenotypes. That's just the same as the one which is on Moodle. Um, and if you say pool.geno from multi-trait, um, multi-trait, multi-trait, um, and then just show a little part, one to 10, one to 10. Right, then you see here that it's exactly the same as before. Hey, you see the same markers, um, they just, the individual names are not there, um, but that's because they're already matched inside of this multi-trade object. Um, here we can then pull the phenotypes as well, which is more or less the same. Um, and then you see again that it's the same phenotypes that, that we saw before. So hydroxypropyl, hydroxybutanyl, and so on. So if we want to do a QTL scan, we can just say plot scan one, of multi-trade, right? And then we have to specify which one we want to do. So we want to say phenotype column is one. So just take the first phenotype, scan it, and you see that you get a profile just as what we did before in the uh, in the standard t-testing method. Hey, hey, look look at the overview. I just got a new follower, Jaden Quintana. Thank you for following me. Uh, it actually works. It actually works. It, it, it actually shows you the latest followers. Yay! <laughs> Yay for programming JavaScript to uh, interact with the Twitch API. Um, but let's go back to the CTL or to the QTL mapping. So here you see just the same QTL profile as before. If we scan a couple of the other ones, right, then um, we see that this one only has a single peak. So this is phenotype number two. Um, do it like this and then for example we can look at phenotype number three phenotype number four uh, phenotype number five and so on but here at phenotype number five we see something interesting right we do not find a region in the genome which is associated you can see here that the maximum score that we get is around 1.2 right so for we have measured a phenotype we've done a whole big experiment but we find no genetic regulators for this phenotype that's, 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 that's interesting, right? Because we spend a lot of money genotyping these. Um, I'm sorry guys, the, the mood box crashed when, when we went to the, to the bunnies. I really have to fix that it doesn't crash. It, it just needs a new code to, to log into the chat. But it, it, when I switch from one scene to the other, it, it, it's just a little bug disappointed <laughs> yeah I'm disappointed as well I was actually hoping that it would work uh, but at least it still follows the the, the followers right and, but here this is <laughs> so this is really interesting right and and this sometimes happens sometimes you have your phenotype of interest hey you spend a lot of money genotyping like hundreds of individual um, you measure the phenotypes and then you do the QTL mapping and you find nothing Right, so for this phenotype, we would just say, well, oh, for phenotype five, um, which is called um, one, two, three, four, five. So it's for the menil, methyl sulfonyl propyl amount in the Arabidopsis plants that we are looking at here, uh, we do not find a difference. So we wasted a lot of money measuring this methyl sulfonyl propyl. We, we genotyped individuals and we don't find anything. Um, hey, of course, we have 24 other phenotypes measured, so at least that's good. Um, so we still have something we can publish, but normally if you would have only measured this phenotype, then now you would, would have probably wasted around 50,000 euros 
on your experiment and you would have nothing to be to put in your publication right but fortunately we have measured multiple phenotypes right so because this phenotype 5 does not have a QTL let's look and see if this one has a CTL right um, so we can use the CTL scan function I think that's called CTL scan um, and then I'm scan CTL how did I call my function C I think it's capitalized CTL scan yeah, so we have CTL scan dot cross, which just takes a cross object. So we can CTL scan dot cross multi trait, and we just store this in res, right? So what it will do, it will now start doing the um, computation for all of the CTLs, and this will take some time because it has to do phenotype one versus phenotype two, phenotype one versus three, one versus four, and it has to do that for all of the twenty four phenotypes in there. Fortunately it is relatively optimized. So um, I spend a lot of time working together with some people in um, Oak Ridge National Laboratory and they made a new correlation algorithm which is much faster than the one that, that I was originally using so it already finished. Um, when I was doing my PhD I had to wait around like 10 minutes for this simple small data set to finish. Um, but now we have our results right so here we have our res and then it says that this is a, a CTL object and we scan 24 phenotypes in total. Um, and now we can just do a plot of this res and we can plot the fifth one right because we're interested in the fifth phenotype. Um, because the fifth phenotype dot did not show a QTL. So now it's fingers crossed, right, and hope that it shows a CTL with one of the other phenotypes. So here we then see the output picture that we get, and we see that although, um, wait, this is not the fifth one, because this has a massive QTL actually. Um, res, res 5. Um, number of markers, number of phenotypes. Let me see. I think something went wrong, and it's actually showing me the wrong. Three, four, five. Ah, right. Yeah, I use a slightly different scanning method, so I do find a QTL for the fifth one. Um, that's a shame. And it's like bugging up my all right anyway it doesn't really matter um, what I should have done is actually give it the QTL results that I had so let me let me redo that right so we do a scan one of the multi trait we say phenocol is five and this is our QTL result and now we do a CTL scan of multi trait phenocol is five because we want to do um, and then now we can add add QTL add QTL is um, I think QTL res um, comma 3 what do you mean unused argument let me look at the help it's been been some time ago since I worked on it um, ah uh, QTL is true. Yeah, yeah, use the internal slow QTL mapping method for QTL. All right, so we can we can do it like this. All right, anyway, and like normally you would say that okay, we did not find anything, but still, when we look at this profile, we find something interesting, right? We we find that although now using the QTL mapping routine which is in the CTL scan we do find the QTL on chromosome 5 right so there is something on chromosome 5 which is more or less determining the average but we see also here that on chromosome 4 um, phenotype number 5 is actually losing correlation um, with the butanil and with the benzo uh, benzoyl hexyl right so on chromosome 4 there seems to be a regulator which regulates the correlation of this fifth phenotype with two of the other phenotypes and if we would have just done the the QTL scan right we would not have learned that on chromosome 4 there is a regulator which is involved in the regulation of this phenotype right we would have only learned on chromosome 5 there is something which is um, which is doing uh, which is influencing the which is influencing the trait so hey, here we see that that using this method you get a additional peak 
so you get an additional kind of information uh, which is not present in the QTL scan that you did and that is the advantage of using CTL scanning is that it can it can show you where phenotypes lose their correlation or where phenotypes gain correlation um, and hey, it can even use this to build up a genetic network of which phenotype is controlling which phenotype um, and um, and there's a lot of additional methods in, in there uh, to kind of drill down to see exactly what is happening. Um, and you could even just plot uh, the whole thing. And then here you see, this, uh, you see an overview of all of the different markers that we have on the genome. Hey, you see, oh, this looks a little bit annoying. Is, uh, so let's give a little bit more space so we want to give a little bit more space on the bottom definitely more space on the side um, and then like this um, par mar so we're just going to set the margin a little bit bigger oh sorry and then we're going to plot so now we can more or less read it right so you see that the first phenotype um, has this and so here you see a heat map and you can see here for when we look at the one, two, three, four, fifth phenotype and we see that the fifth phenotype seems to be regulated from chromosome 4 uh, it seems to be regulated from chromosome 5 as well or it loses correlation with other phenotypes so this is just the summary across all of the different phenotypes and then you can look into which phenotypes are causing a correlation loss um, for this phenotype at this location so it's, 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 a, it's a method which gives you additional information besides standard QTL information. Um, and you also see that hey, there's actually three regulators regulating these phenotypes. So there's one on chromosome 4, which is controlling more or less the first couple of phenotypes. And there's one on 5, which is not visible everywhere. And there's a massive regulator on chromosome 1, which is more or less controlling the, the deoxy uh, um, methodology. I hope that's clear. Like, if there have any questions, then feel free to ask me. Um, it's just never do a live demo um, because that always goes wrong. I actually don't understand why my method finds a QTL at the fifth one, while while the standard QTL mapping method doesn't find a QTL there. So let's just go. Um, and go through them, see if there's any one which I think it's 24 or something. No, that didn't have a significant CTL either. Yeah, this one is very clear that has a QTL and a CTL at the same place here as well. So we don't find a new genetic locus here also not. And so it, the idea is, is that it gives you additional information. And, but here you see that just a single QTL scan teaches you that phenotype number 20 is controlled from chromosome 1. But it's not only controlled from chromosome 1. It also loses the correlation with the uh, isohamnectine deoxyhydrous yeah, but that's the idea between CTL mapping is that you don't just get a genetic locus which is, which is controlling your trait of interest but also shows you how the correlation of this trait is lost with other phenotypes. And then the fifth one is a quite nice example yeah, because you would have never said something on chromosome 4 is driving this phenotype. Yeah, just looking at the QTL profile you would have only looked at chromosome 5. But looking at the CTL profile, you would now get the idea that it might be worth my time also investigating chromosome 4 and see why this phenotype is losing correlation on chromosome 4 uh, combined to the other one, uh, combined to the other phenotypes. All right, so that's just what I wanted to show you guys. Um, software is available. It's called library CTL. Um, and hey, in case that you ever do a QTL scan and hey, you've measured multiple phenotypes and one of your phenotypes just doesn't show a QTL for some reason, um, hey, then it's definitely worth it just trying the uh, CTL scan method um, to figure out um, if you can find genetic regulators, not that regulate your phenotype directly, but which break your link between genotype or which which control the the correlation between your phenotype of interest and some of the other phenotypes that you've measured. 
All right, at least I'm gonna stop the recording for the people watching on Moodle, so um, see you guys next week on Moodle and I will upload the um, the assignments as soon as possible for the primer design lecture as well. All right, so see